What you're looking at here may well be the world's most popular medical treatment of all time, bloodletting, literally letting the patient bleed. Um, that took place from around the time of ancient Egypt to about 100 years ago, and it could cure anything, acne, diabetes, pneumonia, mental illness. You know it was working if the patient swooned, even better, they fainted. Ancient Romans would treat wounds with animal dung. They would also use chicken brains. Sometimes we think we're making something better, and we make it worse. Why does this happen? Is this due to stupidity? Were the Romans dumb? Were they morons? Is that why they're doing it? I think the reason is they didn't understand the malady they were trying to cure. And I think one day that is how we are going to look upon the epidemic of obesity. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Warning, I do not have a miracle diet to sell you. I will not tell you how to lose weight. But I think after I'm done speaking, you'll never think of losing weight or dieting or even gaining weight the same weight again. I want to talk to you about why it is that so many people eat too much food. This is a problem we've been having a serious discussion about for about 50 years. And I think it's safe to say that not only is everything we're doing not working, it seems to be making things worse. The obesity epidemic got going around 1980. And back then, we thought fat is what made you fat. It, it seems simple. You eat fat, you get fat. We spent about 20 years fighting a war on fat. It didn't work. We gained weight. We spent the next 20 years fighting a war on carbs. That also failed. We gained weight. We spend about $72 billion a year trying to weigh less than we weigh. Why do we do this every year? Because it's not working. Statistically speaking, a diet is a better, dieting is a better predictor of weight gain than it is weight loss. So why does nothing work? I mean, it's as though we are cursed when it comes to the simple act of eating food. And the reason, apparently, is that, well, we are cursed. We evolved in an environment in which calories were scarce, and we now live in a, an environment where calories are everywhere. Evolution has given us an appetite that is by its nature out of sync with our needs. The stomach is an unfillable pit, and our brain is stuck in the Stone Age. Some people say that we're addicted to food, and when you look at the brain scans, they tell a similar story. We see that the brains of people with obesity or people with binge eating disorder, it's not that they enjoy food too much, is that they suffer crippling cravings for food. Well, this here is the part I think we're getting wrong, the part that is actually making things worse and not better. It's not the brain scans that are wrong. It's not the, statist the statistics. It's our understanding of this thing right here, the brain, because the part of the brain that eats, I don't believe is stuck in the Stone Age. I don't think the stomach is an unfillable pit. I think when it comes to eating, the brain possesses a power and an intelligence we are just on the cusp of understanding. The brain is the reason that diets don't work. And this is the story about all diets. They all work, just not for very long. You go on a diet, the weights start to melt away. You feel good. You fit into your old genes. People stop in the street, they say, you look great. And you feel great. It's around the six to eight month mark that things start to go south. The weight starts to come back. People say, the diet was working, I failed. But that's not what happens. What happens is your brain intervenes and your brain says, I know you're losing weight and I want you to gain back the weight. I want you to return to your former weight. And we experience that in the form of hunger and fatigue. And the weight comes back. But here's the interesting thing about the brain is it doesn't want you to weigh too much. Because scientists do overfeeding studies. They take subjects and put them in a lab and they feed them too much food and it's misery. The first time they did this, they had to do it at a prison because ordinary free living people we're not willing to endure the agony of eating too much food. And it makes sense when you think about it, because our ancestors in that calorie-scarce environment, if they weighed too much, they couldn't accelerate quickly, they couldn't decelerate, they couldn't turn, they couldn't catch prey easily, and they would have more easily become a juicy, delectable prey. If calories are so scarce, one of the silliest things you can do is walk around carrying a bunch of extra calories, because that takes calories. You know how when you drive a bigger car, you put more gas into it? Well, bodies are no different. A bigger body takes more fuel. I'm 170 pounds. I'm six feet tall. If I weighed 200 pounds, if I had 30 pounds of that insurance, I would burn an extra 200 calories. I'd have to eat an extra 200 calories every day just to lug around that extra weight and maintain it. That's why when these overfeeding studies come to an end, the subjects snap back to their old weight. They lose the weight, the pounds come off. The same way that people who diet, they snap back to their old weight. 
it's as though the brain has this idea in its head of how much it wants you to weigh. Scientists call it a set point. Well, how does the brain pull this off? It's amazing. It's because your brain loves to measure. There is an obsessed accountant living inside your brain. It measures every calorie you take in. You think of that as taste and flavor, but to your brain, it's information. And it's not just food in the mouth that the brain measures. There are nutrient sensors in your stomach all through the digestive tract. This is how good at measuring and managing calories your brain is. A scientist at the National Institutes of Health named Kevin Hall, he studied people taking a drug called canagliflozin. Say that 10 times, canagliflozin. This is a drug given to diabetics. It diverts sugar into the urine. Subjects have no idea this is happening. So as these people were going out th their business, every day they were flushing away 360 calories down the toilet. They didn't know this was just happening. They didn't know if it was a placebo group, placebo group, nothing. The weight loss should have been fantastic. It should have been 20, 25 pounds. That's not what happened because their brains twigged onto the fact something's not right. And for every pound they lost, there was an unconscious uptick in appetite to the point that for every 360 calories they were losing, they gained, they unconsciously ate an extra 350 calories. So the story's not really anything like what we're told. The brain isn't stuck in the Stone Age. It's not dumb. The stomach isn't this unfillable pit. The brain is intelligent, and something is making millions of intelligent brains crave too much food. So I think we need to ask a different question. What would make an intelligent brain crave too much food? Well, let's talk about the brain for a second. What activity lights up more gray matter than anything, more than doing calculus, more than having sex, more than doing Wordle, more than having sex while doing Wordle? I'm trying. <laughs> eating food, the experience of eating food. If you think of your genome as the instruction set to make you, what part of your body do you think takes up the most code, the most instructions? It's not your brain, it's not your eyeballs, it's not your gonads, it's this right here. The nose and mouth, your flavor and taste sensing equipment. So maybe taste has something to do with this. I'm gonna tell you a quick story about taste. This story was told in Current Biology. I know you're all subscribers. This was a study performed by a neuroscientist at Yale named Dana Small. She was curious about taste. She wanted to know, is it possible to create beverages that are just as rewarding but have fewer calories? Well, how, do you, how do you figure something like that out? This is what she did. She created five separate drinks. She gave them each a distinctive flavor and color. But she used the artificial sweetener called sucralose so that every drink had 75, it tasted like it had 75 calories worth of sugar. But of course it had none because she was using sucralose. She then used a tasteless starch called maltodextrin to give each drink a different payload of calories. So these are calories you can't taste. One drink had zero, one had 37, one had 75, one had 112, and one had 150. She, give these drinks to, she gives these drinks to her subjects. They drink them. The brains measure, measure food coming in the mouth, in the gut. Brains form opinions. She invites them back to her lab, and she scans their brains as they're tasting each of these drinks. Well, what do you think happened? How did these brains respond to these drinks? Is it, I mean, are they all the same? Does the brain value them all the same because, you know, the brain just likes sweetness? Sweetness is all that matters. Or did that 150-calorie drink get the brain more excited because what the brain really loves is calories? Well, this is a weird one because it was neither. It was the 75-calorie drink. This made no sense. It, the other drinks, it was like there wasn't a brain response. This didn't go as it was supposed to go. It was so bizarre that Dana Small did it again. It happened again. So the next thing she does is she invites subjects into the indirect calorimeter. This is a device that measures what's called the thermic effect of food. When we eat food, your body starts to process the calories. That produces heat. We can measure that heat. The more calories you consume, the bigger the heat production. So one day, a young woman in her 20s, she comes in, she drinks the 75-calorie drink. Blah, blah, blah. Beautiful little plume of feed. Everything's going according to plan. A few days later, she comes in, she drinks the 150-calorie drink. There's no effect. There's no heat. It's like she drank a cup full of air. What on earth is going on? Dana Small is flummoxed. And then she's struck by a number. And that number is 75, because all of those drinks tasted as though they had 75 calories worth of sugar. Only one drink actually had 75 calories. 
This drink was matched. The taste matched the calories. The other drinks were mismatched. Dana Small calls this nutritive mismatch. And this is a breakthrough discovery because it tells us two very important things. The first is that sweetness is not this frivolous sensation from the Stone Age that is disconnected from the important business of metabolism and nutrition. Sweetness and nutrition and metabolism, they go hand in hand. Sweetness is food telling your brain, these are how many calories are coming. And the second thing it tells us is that accuracy is important because when it's matched, it all works beautifully. Those calories are metabolized, the brain is aware, the brain is happy about it. When it's mismatched, it's like things fall apart. And they really fall apart because Dana Small did more studies and she found that the brain doesn't passively endure this mismatch, it tries to correct the problem. And this starts to interfere with glucose tolerance, with the amount of insulin that's secreted. We see this is reminiscent of metabolic disease. Does this cause metabolic disease? Well, she did a study with adolescents and they had to actually br bring this to a screeching halt because early on they drew blood from three participants and two, their blood looked like they were pre-diabetic. So I think we can say that maybe mucking around with the way food tastes isn't such a good idea. Only I think it's so much worse than this because we talk about how the brain loves to measure. Some scientists talk of the brain as though it is a prediction engine. It is constantly gathering data through the senses to create a statistical model of the exterior world. That is how it thrives, that is how it survives. Well, what happens when that information-loving brain, when that prediction-loving brain starts to get information that isn't reliable? Because this is new. This is something that's new with food. Carbs and fat are not new. But mucking around with sweet taste, that's, that's pretty recent. Our ancestors might have been hard to get that sweet fruit, they might have had to climb a tree, they might have been a big cat waiting to eat them, but the fruit didn't lie. The sweeter it was, the more calories it had. Well, now sweetness, what does it mean? On a Monday, a sweet signal could, could mean 200 calories, that same signal on a Tuesday could mean 20, or 50, or zero. Well, there's a very predictable way that brains respond to this. Psychologists call it reward prediction error, which means very simply, the predicted reward didn't arrive. Another term for it is uncertainty, and brains respond universally, not just humans, we see it in animals, and they don't brood in kind of curiosity. They get excited, they wanna act. Why is that? Because for our ancestors, an uncertain prospect, something that they needed that was a maybe, well, that meant they might not get it, and if that keeps happening, you die. So our ancestors that, that took action, that got excited when they were faced with an uncertain prospect, they're the ones that survived, they're the ones that thrived. This is what is baked into our genes. It's how we react to uncertainty. And uncertainty is the element we are baking into our food. It's not just sweetness. You've probably never heard of fat replacers, but you've almost certainly consumed them this week, maybe today, absolutely in your life. They are everywhere. Um, fat replacers are what made the 1980s miracle of light salad dressing and light everything possible. Fat replacers create the illusion of creamy fatness in the mouth and only deliver a paltry little payload of calories to the stomach. What a great idea if your brain is a Stone Age moron. What a terrible idea if your brain is obsessed with measuring. The food environment we exist in is saturated with this stuff. Think about mayonnaise. There's extra creamy, there's regular, there's olive oil, there's half the fat. How can the brain predict how many calories it's getting from mayonnaise based on the taste? It can't. This looks like a Dana Small experiment, but it's mayonnaise. Since the 1960s, we've been using flavor technology, artificial flavors, natural flavors, to make food taste like whatever we want it to taste like. Junk food wouldn't taste like anything if it wasn't for flavor technology. We live in a food environment where so much of what we eat doesn't actually taste like what it actually is. And remember maltodextrin, that tasteless starch that Dana Small put in those mismatched drinks to fool her subjects? We produce a million tons of maltodextrin in North America every year. So I just want you to think for a moment about your poor brain. The part of your brain that eats, it doesn't read diet books, it doesn't read the nutritional info panel. The only relationship it has with food is what it can sense. And this is what we've been messing with artificial flavors, fat replacers, fake flavors, that is a lot of mismatch. That is a lot of uncertainty. And what in theory should all that uncertainty be causing? 
exactly what we see in the brain scans, elevated motivation, craving. We eat too many calories because we crave calories because we made ourselves crave calories. We changed food and then we ate that food and then that food changed us. So it makes you wonder, I mean, if we spent the last 50 years, instead of trying to te technologically alter food, but we just embraced the goodness of what the land produces and what the sea produces, would things be different? If instead of living in fear of food, we loved food, would things be different? Well, there is a part of the world that does this. It is a magical, fantastic wonderland called Northern Italy. <laughs> this is Bologna. That's where we get the word bologna from. They call it mortadella. And those are actual cubes of white fat. That is not fat replacer. And the thing about Italians is they argue about food more than we do. But they don't argue about nutrients. They argue about recipes. They have had very firm ideas about exactly how to make mortadella for 300 years. If you go to the Chamber of Commerce in Bologna, there is a repository of recipes. If you want to make things like lasagna or tortellini or their famous ragu alla bolognese, there is a certain way to make it. And that noodle you see there, pasta, which we spent a good while thinking was deadly, that is their favorite noodle, the tagliatella noodle. They love it so much that they have a version of it, the perfect platonic exquisite noodle cast in gold. <laughs> How do you figure you make that noodle? It's not with fat replacers. It's, there's no maltodextrin in it. There's no artificial sweeteners. You make it with carbs and fat. The two nutrients we have been running away from and living in fear of, the northern Italians weave together in ethereal combinations. So let's just feast on one final statistic. The rate of obesity, the last time we checked here in America, 42%. In northern Italy, land of fat and carbs and delicious food, it is less than 8%. So I think it's all quite simple. I think this problem we're getting wrong, it comes down to the brain. It loves to eat. We need to eat to survive. The brain loves to measure instead of starving that brain, instead of fooling that brain. Let's just feed that brain. Thank you. <laughs>